Welcome to One Mic. I'm your host, Country Boy, and today we're going to talk about the Negro Leagues. I went into this subject almost completely blind, only knowing tidbits about uh, a few of the uh, larger known players like Satchel Page and Jobs Gibson and Rube Foster, and uh, found out that the subject is way more vast than a few select star players. So I, it's really interesting. I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, without further ado, um, you know what to do. Same thing I do every every show. If you like this, you love this, please consider donating to our Patreon page. We now have a Buy Me Coffee page that will allow you to give a one-time uh, donation. Also, if you like this, you love this, please review us on Apple Podcasts. Please give us five stars so we can uh, maybe get charted. That would be awesome. And and lastly, if you like this, you love this, you can. Uh, we also also host the Cut, which is a um, roundtable discussion podcast with a few of my friends. So you can listen to the Cut for all your pop culture needs. Anyway, uh, let's get started. Baseball was originally played by men of rival athletic clubs for recreation. As the popularity of baseball began to expand, it led to the formation of amateur clubs in the second half of the 19th century. After the Civil War in 1865, baseball's popularity exploded dramatically. It was at this early time that it was still an amateur sport played by all races. There were all white teams, there were some all black teams, and there was some integrated teams. Record exists of abbreviated games between two black teams as far back as 1855, but there also was a precedent for black and white teams playing together as far back as 1870. John Bud Fowler is often credited with being the first black man to play organized white baseball in 1872. There was almost certainly some black players that preceded John Bud Fowler, but John Bud Fowler was the first black player to be recorded playing with an organized professional white baseball team. There are clippings that exist of Fowler playing with minor league teams from Lynn, Massachusetts to Canuck, Iowa. He pitched for a Canadian league called the Maple Leafs in Ontario, but when the white players objected to playing with them, he was released. And none of these teams could ever be considered a major league team. That term didn't even exist until 1876 when the National League was formed from the six strongest teams from the National Association. They withdrew from that organization, effectively killing it to form a new league so the owners could have stronger central authority over the players. This move occurred when the owners began to seek to reduce player authority. The National League created a reserve clause, which is a mandatory part of contracts in 1887 and bound all players to their teams for the life of their careers unless the owners decided to trade them. Fans also felt the change from the National Association to the National League because the National League forbade Sunday games and the sale of liquor at ballparks. These draconian measures from the National League still didn't stop the baseball boom in America. The American Association was founded in 1882 and was founded as a cheaper alternative to the National League. Charging 25 cents is mission in, instead of the usual 50 cents at the National League games. And additionally, the National League also prohibited the sale of alcohol on its grounds while the American Association had no such restrictions and they became known as the Beer and Whiskey League in reference to the fact that they sold beer and whiskey, but also because their biggest backers were breweries and distilleries. Together, the National League and the American Association participated in an early version of the World Series seven times during their 10-year coexistence. After the 1891 season, the American Association would disband and merge with the National League, and they would become legally known for the next decade as the National League and American Association. Regardless of these major league changes, African-American baseball players didn't share in this windfall. African-Americans would have to scavenge through various levels of professional baseball 
football. And in 1883, a catcher named Moses Fleetwood Walker of the Toledo Blue Stockings became the first African-American player to play in what be considered a big league in the American Association. In 1884, the three big leagues consisted of the National League, the Union Association, and the American Association. The Blue Stockings played in the American Association for only one season in 1884 before moving back down to the minor leagues and disbanding in 1885. Thus, Walker became the first black player to play in the big leagues without anyone actually taking notice. Now, Walker still faced outright hostility and physical intimidation from his teammates and opponents. His own teammate, pitcher Tony Mullinane would intentionally throw balls in the dirt to attempt to injure his teammate and on several occasions he was injured and even fractured ribs during the season as a result Mullinane would refuse to acknowledge Walker's signals and intentionally cross him up but would later in an interview state that he was the best catcher I ever worked with Mullinane would recall in an interview that I dislike a negro and whenever I had to pitch to him I used to pitch anything I wanted without looking at his signals one day he signaled a curve and I shot him a fastball and he called it and walked down to me and said, Mr. Mullinane, I'll catch you without signals, but I won't catch you if you're going to cross me when I give you a signal. And for the rest of the season, he caught anything I pitched without knowing what was coming. When the Toledo's played at home or nearby on the road, it was almost tolerable. But when the Blue Stockings went on the road in the South, Walker was literally taking his life in his hands. Adrian Cap Anson was a pioneer of baseball and the first superstar of the game. He played most of his career with the Chicago White Stockings. But he also was a horrible racist who openly hated people of color. He would deliver some of that hate to the White Stockings mascot, a black song and dancing mascot by the name of Clarence Duvall. He would call him a no account nigger and a chocolate covered coon. He was largely responsible for the unwritten gentleman's agreement, which saw to black players being blackballed from the major national league. He was a segregationist and he used his stature within the game to push his views of segregation. His involvement in pushing this gentleman's agreement originally in August 10th of 1883 when the Chicago White Stockings played an exhibition game against the Toledo Blue Stockings. Anson saw that Moses Fleetwood Walker was a catcher for the Blue Stockings as is a man that he had never met. He refused to take the field if Walker was to play. Now Walker was not originally scheduled to catch that day but upon hearing his demands Toledo's manager Charlie Morton decided to start Walker in the outfield and Anson eventually relented so he wouldn't miss out on his share of the gate. In 1884, Chicago played Toledo again, which had moved to the American League. And Walker set out this game after Chicago requested the assurances in writing that no black player of any position would play in their exhibition game. By 1885, the Blue Stockings were looking for any way to end this racial tension by subtracting Walker. So when Walker cracked the rib, he was released in July of 1885. The result of the Anson Walker ordeal was a most shameful time in the history of baseball. This gentleman's agreement ensured 63 years of Major League Baseball conspiring to keep black players out of their game. Several top black players in the air, including infielder Frank, Frank Grant, but Fowler and pitchers George Stovey were left to fight for a few spots on minor league teams. Many of the black players relocated to the prominent International League, which was the strongest minor league formed in 1884, playing in New Jersey, New York, and Southeastern Canada. However, racial tensions persisted. It was not simply that black players were black, but the black players were black and good, which of course they had to be because they wouldn't have been allowed in the league otherwise. But letting black players play in the International League was one thing, but showing them up was another. Frank Grant laid waste to the league's pitchers in 1887, averaging a, averaging a C360 batting average, and many of the white players in retaliation took to cutting down black players for sport. But Fowler was the first to use shin guards by strapping wood splints over his shins when he played second base for, for Binghamton. It was either that or become a pin cushion for white players since they slid into the bag and, the and their spikes went flying, aiming to injure his lower legs. Bud Fowler and Franklin Grant 
would intentionally muff balls so they wouldn't have to touch runners, fearing that it might be an attempt to injure them. And most pitchers in the league would try their best to aim for colored players when they were at bat, with one pitcher aiming for Frank Grant's head all the time. In Buffalo, a white pitcher even refused to sign with the Bisons because of his presence of Frank Grant and the Toronto World declared that a number of colored players in the International League put it mildly, their presence is a distaste to other players. The press would even attempt to state that black players in the International League had not been productive in the same year that Frank Grant hit 388 and Bud Fowler hit 350. In July, so in July 14th of 1887, the board of the International League would meet at the Genovese Little Hotel in Buffalo with the purpose of attempting to shift one of the teams to another city. However, in response to the growing tension and unease of black players, the league voted to exclude all future contracts to African Americans. This motion passed 6-4 to four, with only teams with black players being against it. The current players were left alone to continue their contract as they expired, but as Black players returned to their white teams in 1888. It was a revolving door with George Stovey, who won 35 games in 1887, being let go before the season even began. And Fleet Walker and Franklin Grant remained with their league teams. But in 1888, Grant left to go play for the Cuban Giants, and in a strange irony, the first black player to play for the major leagues was now the last black player standing in the minor leagues. In 1895, the U.S. Supreme Court had written segregation into national law. Plessy Ferguson approved separate schools for white children, and in the South, state laws and ordinances placed limits on the use of public facilities by African Americans and forbade athletic competition petition between blacks and whites. In the North, African Americans were not segregated by law, but it was a local custom dictated that they were still second class citizens. So with black players being excluded from professional teams and by the start of the 20th century, no black player would play on a white professional baseball team. In spite of this exclusion, black players formed and played on all black teams, finding opportunities with traveling teams. One of the first black professional teams was the Cuban Giants. Formed in 1885, the team was about as Cuban as Chitlins and formed under the pretense of being dark-skinned Cuban Americans. The creator of the Cuban Giants, Frank Bree Thompson, was a head waiter at the Argyle Hotel in Babylon, Long Island. He formed the baseball team from waiters because their baseball play amused the white patrons. Encouraged by their makeshift team's popularity, he took them on the road and signed a few players from a prominent semi-pro team in Philadelphia called the Orions. This move made the Giants one of the strongest independent teams on the East Coast, and Thompson would later indicate that the Cuban Giants were not just a bunch of hotel waiters. They were athletic entertainers at the hotels at the resort hotel, and the players used to supplement their incomes by working as waiters and bellhops and porters. But their occupation, but their occupation was not as hotel employees, but as professional players. Allegedly, the name Cuban Giants came when they first started playing away in hopes to conceal the fact that they were just a bunch of African American hotel waiters and avoid the hostility of white Americans by passing as Cubans, but this ruse wouldn't have deceived informed baseball fans who had already had become accustomed to the euphemisms Spanish, Cuban, and even Arabian being applied to black baseball players. But soon, their new owner, Walter Cook, felt that he could attract more white fans by playing up the Hispanic aspects. So the players would begin to speak gibberish and cackle loudly in a parody how everyone thought Hispanics acted. But there was no con in the way they played. They were simply the strongest independent team on the East Coast. And the novelty of playing a team of color players gave them the right to pick and choose the white teams that they played. Teams that wanted no parts of black players on their roster were eager to schedule games against a thinly failed blacks posing as Cubans. And it allowed white teams to benefit from the Cubans' popularity. Even big league teams looked the other way when it came to playing the Cubans. And in 1887, the National League Detroit Wolverines played an exhibition game against the Cubans, winning 6-3. The Cubans even had an exhibition canceled at the last minute when 
from the American Association team, the St. Louis Browns team owner, Chris Vaughn Dale Ave, on the eve of the game, wrote a statement. We, St. Louis Baseball Club, do not agree to play against the Negroes tomorrow. We will cheerfully play against a white team at any time, and this thing, by refusing to play, we think we are doing is right. The Cubans view this act as confirmation that big league players were afraid of playing them, and the team would begin barnstorming across the Northeast from one sold-out game to the next, with players earning up to $18 a week. And in 1890, with Frank Grant and George Stovey, the club reportedly won 100 of 104 games. With black ball as a whole struggling and black fans not being able to afford the games, in 1892, the Cubans were the only black team operating on a full-time basis. Now, the situation for the Cuban Giants was not all rosy. When Walter Cook passed away, the team was sold to J.M. Bright, who was a great businessman, but he just did not have the same relationship between his players that he had with Walter Cook, and the players would leave in mass. Most of the time, Bright was able to reassemble his team of dissenting of players, but when the team's players finally found an owner they liked in white businessman E.B. Lamar Jr., he would sign the entire team of Cuban Giants. Giants in 1896 and called his new team ex-Cuban Giants or the Cuban ex-Giants. Bright would sue Lamar for infringement with Lamar stating that we are informed legally at this time that the Cuban ex-Giants are not incorporated and we are imperfectly within our rights to use the name and the courts agreed. Thereafter, J.M. Bright would attempt to put together an inferior team and call them the, the genuine Cuban Giants or the original Cuban Giants. J.B. Lamar would be the first in a long line of teams to use the word Cubans in their name and in hopes to emulate the success of John M. Bright's success. Later, as real Cubans began to play in America, they would have to borrow their own name back from a group of non-Cubans. The creation of the Cuban Giants meant the birth of an entire black subculture of baseball developing simultaneously with its white counterparts while maintaining its own distinct identity. In 1890, four entire seasons the Cuban Giants were the only viable professional black team in the East, mostly due to the increased toxic atmosphere at the time. The exclusion of black players from the major leagues and minor leagues created a patent for black ball success that would help the Cuban Giants establish black ball as a viable economic entity. Although the number of black teams remained small, they had favorable reviews and some black businessmen began to see an all Negro teams as a means of cashing in on the appeal of these players. By the turn of the century, the Cuban Giants were no longer the dominant African-American baseball team. They were a victim of their own success, which encouraged imitation of their model. As African Americans began to flee the South and represented a huge labor pool by being recruited by Northern industrialists, one of the teams that would attempt to imitate the Cuban Giants' success was the Chicago Unions. In 1888, Frank Leland put together a group of Chicago black businessmen to sponsor the Black Amateur Union Baseball Club. Unable to secure a place to play within the city, the unions played on some prairie turf outside of town. Frank Leland was an immense man with large ears and slick hair pomade on the sides with the part right down the middle and he wore a giant mustache. He was obsessed with baseball and he played center fielder for the unions but he also was the club's idea man. Leland had no intention of battling umpires so when the union played a team from outside of Chicago they had no choice but to use the union's choice of home plate umpires which would be Frank Leland himself. He had a hand in every move that the team made and used his connections within the city, he was able to procure a permit for a home base for the unions at a ragtag field on the south side of Chicago at 37th and Langley Avenue. In 1894, after the White Stockings had vacated the 9,000 seat South Side Park field, Leland obtained the lease on the grounds. He also recruited Major R.R. Jackson, a local businessman, to help with the finances. Jackson knew almost nothing about 
about baseball, but he was more than content to act as the team's financial secretary. Leland's team played in Chicago only on Sundays against semi-pro white teams in the Chicago City League while continuing to barnstorm the farm belt during the week. While they crisscrossed the farm belt, Leland would make mental notes of the best players for, for future rating attempts of their black talent. Leland had an eye for talent, and he stocked the union with some of the best talent in the area. With the Cuban Giants fading, the unions would turn their attention to the ex-Cuban Giants for a more formidable opponent. In 1898, the unions would play a 14-game series against the Cuban ex-Giants in and around Chicago. The crowds for this occasion were enormous, with all the games being hotly contested. But in the end, the Cuban ex-Giants won the title in the 14-game series, winning 9 of 14 games. Frank Leland's fortunes would begin to turn slightly when the Chicago White Sox chose to renovate Southside Field, which the unions were using as their home base. As the union's home was torn down, Leland used his connections within the city to lease the use of Auburn Park, which was a field on 79th and Wentworth, only a few miles from Southside Park. And in 1901, he would change the name of the team from the Chicago Unions to the Chicago Union Giants. In their first season in 1902, it would be the first recorded presence of a new pitcher from Texas by the name of Andrew Rube Foster. Leland would describe Foster as his protege and described the youngster as being able to throw the ball through a brick wall. After losing his first few starts, Leland sent Foster to the semi-pro unit far removed from the pressures of big city Chicago ball and it would be long till Foster was back with a vengeance and Frank Leland would have no idea that his pitcher would usher in the golden age of black baseball and the rule of Rube Foster. Thank you for listening to the first episode of my Negro League series and for the um, and <clears throat> and next week and for the next few weeks, I'm going to release it an episode a week with next week being about Andrew Rube Foster and the golden age of black baseball. Uh, once again, if you like this, if you love this, please consider donating to my Patreon page or my Buy Me Coffee page. My, with my Buy Me Coffee page, you can give the one-time donation of $5, $5 or $10 or even $20, no matter how much uh, your your pockets desire. <laughs> also, if you enjoy this, please consider uh, reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. Please consider don't please consider uh, reviewing us on Apple Podcasts. And lastly, please listen to the cut for all your pop culture needs. And peace to next week. Oh.